other than Aghoris, you've explored the rest of India from... People talk about India like it's one homogenous country, but it's many, many different countries. And You're making room for prana or life force to enter your body. It's important to think, but thinking itself as a habit is a really bad habit. We met someone who was from the tribe. He made the three of us stand and then he started chanting and three crows came and sat right next to us. That's when you realize that... There was a python there and maybe he kicked it or something. And the next day, just as he looked up, she vomited a half-eaten rat. If you make the mistake of interfering with the animal. Who taught you all this? Like, who introduced you to Native American culture in this way? We've done a lot of Tantra-based conversations on TRS, but Tantra is what our culture calls practices that could be considered as a part of the occult. When you talk about global occult, or as I like to call it, global Tantra, there are parallels with what we have here in Indian culture. So this conversation I had with one of our all-stars, Dr. Swoboda, is an exploration of the same thought. You're going to enjoy this conversation a lot if you enjoy our conversations with Rajashi Nandi. This is about deities from other countries, deities from other cultures, as well as, of course, Indian culture and Indian deities. Very deep episode. So sit back, relax, get ready to absorb and get ready to have many of your beliefs challenged because I personally believe that your mind and your soul only grow when you're forced to disagree with yourself and when you're forced to think beyond the realm that you already know. This is Dr. Robert Svoboda on TRS. It's great to see you as well, sir. Um, I remember right after our long conversation from the last time, which we had to divide into two parts, we had this little conversation about how your life is not just limited to everything that you learned in India. So that's what I wanted to make this conversation about. When I saw your name on my schedule, my first thought was, hmm, what are we going to speak about? And I was actually meditating on my way back home here, like in the flight, when I was coming back to Bombay, I was meditating and I just got this intuition that I should talk about your time studying or learning from Native Americans and South America and how possibly... And Africa. And Africa. Okay, I didn't know this. But the rest of India. I mean, I mean the rest of the world. Wow, the rest of India. <laughs> That's what. And the rest of India too. Other than Aghoris, you've explored the rest of India from... Well, many parts of the rest of India, because of course, you know, people talk about India like it's it's one homogenous country, but it's many, many different countries. And, uh, you know, Vimal Ananda used to say that the Assam, the the uh, uh, Kama, uh, Kamakya Devi, he, he used to say she's she's something different even from the Vedas. She's coming down. She's coming from so, so long ago that, yes, on the surface, you know, they've made her into a Mahavidya, et cetera. But really, she's she's something from far a, a different and very, 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 you know, tens of thousands of years old. And so even in India, there are things that, you know, that 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 have ha, are, are older than what we think of as being old. OK, um, the reason I was bringing up the other cultures was because this whole year for me has not just been about Hinduism or Jainism or any of the Indic religions. It's also been about interreligious studies. And the one thing I've learned about religions all over the world is that religions always originated from a preceding religion. And there's lots of religions in the history of the world which have probably just died out. And I'm using the word religion for the lack of a better word. Uh, I don't know what the ancient word for religion would have been. Maybe culture, maybe dharma, I don't know. But the more I learn about Native America or ancient African culture or ancient South American culture, or I had a trip to Australia last year and I figured that even the Aboriginal culture is very similar to the ancient, ancient Indian school of thought. And I don't want to call it the ancient Indian school of thought. It's probably more like even what we follow in India is part of that homogenous culture that was once followed possibly by hunter-gatherers. And now you've studied all over India, you've studied all over the world. Do you disagree with me? Do you agree with me? I totally agree with you. And that's been my experience also. 
Um, you know, the uh, you you bring up Australia. I I have been fortunate. Uh, I haven't been there for a few years because of the pandemic, but um, I've spent probably a couple of months a year there for twenty years, in mostly in one particular area, and I've got to know some things about the land, not so much the indigenous people, but about the land and the people in the land were always very closely connected. And of course, they represent the the oldest, the oldest, more or less intact civilization of humans. About 70,000 years ago, there was a genetic bottleneck for humans. There were as few as a thousand, potentially a thousand people, possibly more like 10,000. But everybody in the world, more than 8 billion people, they've come from those 1,000 to 10,000 people. And after 70,000 years ago, about 60,000-ish years ago, people started, those people started to leave Africa and they, um, they walked all the way along and the uh, sea levels were different then and they got to Australia and they have been maintained. And Australia was cut off then when the sea level sea went back up and they've been maintaining a culture that has very definitely connection to that 60,000 years ago. Okay. And there, in fact, in Tamil Nadu, there's still people who have genetic connection very closely connected to those aboriginals. So there's there's some around the world, you know, if we want to really see what people have been doing in the past, that's a very good place to go. It's it's not uh, as uh, accessible as as some other cultures are, but definitely it's 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 very interesting and if you're polite, you can at least even if you're not from there, you can at least make some connection and and interact with it in a positive way. Okay. Uh, do you have any experiences from Australia? I have a ton, uh, but I'd love to hear some of yours. Maybe I'll give us a little bit of a context on the Aboriginal people to those of uh, the audience members that haven't heard of them. Um, so I'll give a bit of context on the Aboriginal people. Basically, when you go to Australia now, if you go to the big cities, it's multicultural. Uh, it's a lot of white folks. And then it's like people from other countries who've migrated there. Uh, they all acknowledge the fact that Australia was originally inhabited by the Aboriginal people. Uh, when you actually get into studying Aboriginal history, you go to these Aboriginal centers, uh, they will kind of let you in a little bit on their culture. Not completely. Not, not, not much. For some reason, they're very guarded about it. Well, partly because of all the white people who came there and, and afflicted them for so many years. Uh, I believe that around 1500 is when European imperialism started all over the globe. Uh, you know, I, in that time, Bharat, India was uh, basically the richest part of the world. So I don't think European imperialism could just go into India and dominate. But Australia wasn't really a rich part of the world. They were still kind of very linked with the land. They were living off the land. Uh, it's said that when the European imperialists actually arrived in Australia, they even did things like uh, they classified the aboriginals as flora and fauna and told their own people that it's okay to hunt these other people. And the, and that law was still on the books even in the like the 1940s or the 1950s. Wow. It was only repealed then. And if you if you talk to the aboriginal people today, like the descendants, a lot of them are of mixed heritage. They have a lot yes. of white blood as well. Yes. They have this weird sense of um, generational trauma mixed with a little guilt. Uh, so it's it's very difficult conversations with them. You, you sense it, especially when they're talking about their own culture. It's very intricate. Uh, lots of different tools, lots of different uh, uh, ways of life. Uh, you know, they were all family-oriented people, had nuclear families, etc. But if you draw the map of Australia, each tiny part of Australia is divided according to one of their tribes. And there was a bunch of these tribes. Each tribe has something called a... I forgot the word, but it's kind of like a mascot. It's an animal that represents that tribe. Some people you call that a totem. Totem, yeah. Uh, so... Uh, you'd see that, I mean, this is something I spoke to a bunch of them about. I said that, so say if your totem is the Tasmanian tiger, does it mean that you guys also inherit traits of the Tasmanian tiger? And a bunch of them said, yes, that's exactly what it is. 
So if your totem is the orca, you know, like a, a sea animal, you'll see that people from that tribe are a little more relaxed, a little more kind of seaside oriented. Of course, that's an outcome of geography as well, but they're very connected to their totems. I've actually had some occult experiences on that same trip, which I choose not to talk about. Right. Uh, but very intricate culture. And every time you talk to them as an Indian and you share some of your Indian outlooks, like when I spoke to them about Bhumima or Devi, they all got emotional. They were like, this and this is very similar. They did feel a bit of brotherhood with myself and my Indian guys with me. So there's some kind of deep connection between India and Aboriginal Australia for sure. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, sir. Well, I think the, the, the most important thing is that they don't, and I think this is true generally of uh, indigenous people in the Americas also, they don't regard themselves, they don't think of humans as being separate or better than all the other animals and plants. They regard themselves as being very much a part of the environment in which they live. And that's why the land is so important to them. And that's why specific areas... And, you know, they've had tens of thousands of years, so they've had plenty of time to know which areas men are, is, is meant for the men to relate to and which areas to relate to the women to relate to. And in that area where that tribe is, the, their, the people in the tribe, it's their responsibility to look after those parts of the land to make sure that the land and the humans and the animals and the plants all work together and 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 maintain a healthy ecology. And of course, we human beings think that nowadays, the modern human being, we think that everything else is is somehow meant for us to exploit. And that's totally different from the way that they believe and from the way that most um, uh, 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 most traditional people of traditional cultures believe. I can say that. Um, uh, 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 as I, uh, as I said, I, I haven't spent a lot of time with Aboriginal people uh, in Australia, but the place that I've been going to for the past uh, 25 years uh, is a place where the original people there, um, their totem animals were the uh, iguana or the goanna, they call it in Australia, and the python. And so... Uh, it has been very interesting for me to interact with those animals because where my friend lives, uh, pythons periodically enter the house and wander around and the iguanas will wander around and so on because they, they understand that she accepts her, her, herself as being part of that environment. She's not trying to keep them out and 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 maintain a different a distance between them. She's willing to enter into a relationship with them. And then it works very well for her. Okay, I'm not going to reveal the entire story here because I've been told not to, but I'll reveal a part of it. Um, we did this Aboriginal tour on the last day of our trip. Uh, we met someone who was from the tribe whose totem was a crow. Now, crows are actually very, very rare in Australia. Like in my entire Australian trip... I didn't see any crows. Very rare. Like we didn't see any crows across three or four cities that we visited. Now we go into this guy's land. Uh, their temples are actually small pockets of land, either like, you know, a, a grove or like the edge of a cliff. Uh, those are their temples. So he took us there. He said that in my culture, in my tribe, if I have welcomed you into my land, now you're a part of my tribe. That's what my tribe believes. So he did an initiation ceremony. Like he said that now you're a part of my tribe. You're like a brother to me. He said that, do you allow me to invite you into my tribe? So we said, yes. He said, okay, stand. He made the three of us stand. Three Indian guys, he's feeling a connect with us. And then he started chanting. He started clicking and chanting. And those chants were just like bhajans. Okay, and all of us are in that bit of a trance with him. That What's he doing? What's this bhajan? And three crows came and sat right next to us. And all three of us are looking at each other like, what is happening here? And that's when you realize that these ancient people knew a lot more about Mother Nature than modern people do. And a lot more happened on that same trip in that same story, which I choose not to reveal. But uh, there's some strange connection between animals and humans that modern day humans have forgotten about. 
And if you make the mistake um, of interfering with the animal and not treating it with respect, um, the, at, at this house of my friend, she was gone for a few months and she allowed a couple of, an, an Australian couple to live there. And, you know, they're not ignorant people, but he one day, I, I don't know, there was a python there and maybe he kicked it or something. And the next day in the evening, he was at the side of the house and he could felt, feel something dripping onto him. And he looked up and right above him, about, you know, a half a meter above him, there was a python and, you know, they can unhinge their jaws. And she had opened her mouth and just as he looked up, she vomited a half-eaten rat on top of him <sighs> with a bunch of, of, of maggots and all kinds of other things. <laughs> And now at least he knows to be more respectful, see. But I mean, it's you, when you're in a place like that, or, you know, Vimal Ananda would have called it a place that's jagrat, that's alive, you have to be careful. And you, you, you want to, it's like going anywhere where there's powerful, powerful things, powerful people. You have yeah. to be polite. A bunch of the Australian Aboriginals that I met asked me about the importance of animals in Hindu culture. So I said that, the only thing I can think of is the Vahans, like the, um, each, like basically each God has his or her own favorite animal. And maybe those animals are sort of linked to the traits of that God. Okay. Cut to a couple of months ago, I was in Udaipur. Uh, there's a hotel called the Uday Vilas. The land that the Uday Vilas is made on, uh, they had found a Kartikeya statue on that land. Uh, that land is also supposed to be the home to a lot of peacocks. And the staff at the Uday Villa says that very often early in the morning when the sun hits the statue, a lot of the peacocks in Uday Villas will actually go and stand right next to the statue. And Kartikeya statue also has a peacock as its own vahana. Yes. This, so this is the parallel that I thought was very similar to Aboriginal culture, where there's such a deep relationship with animals. There's something in the world of animal consciousness that we're yet to understand. That's what I strongly believe. That people like the Aboriginals have not forgotten yet. Yes. The thing is that we're modern humans and we've forgotten so many things. Yeah. They say that about Bhairav Upasana as well, that if you begin worshipping Kal Bhairav uh, or any of the Bhairavs, Dogs are very drawn to you and dogs won't uh, get aggressive with you. I don't know how true that is, but uh, I have noticed this. Some, some, well, sometimes they won't get aggressive with you. Sometimes uh, I remember going just uh, about a year ago, going to uh, the inauguration of a Kalabaitav temple in Tamil Nadu. And the next day, I mean, I was... In uh, I was I wasn't at the temple. I was probably an hour away, but I was, you know. And there was uh, I was walking along, and um, a, a, a watchdog broke its chain and came over and just grazed my leg, but enough to draw blood. So sometimes the deity might want some blood, and the dog will. So you know, I didn't end up. It didn't even. It it, it didn't break. Uh, it didn't cut my uh, pajama. It broke the skin, though, so I wasn't worried about getting rabies, <laughs> but I did offer the blood. And so it depends on the relationship that you have with the deity. So the dogs definitely are not going to uh, start coming to attack you if you are seriously connected to Kalbaitava, because Kalbaitava will discourage that from happening. We spoke so much about India on the last episode. Uh I want to know the point at which you kind of left India and did you go back to America to kind of study further? Did you travel through the world to study further? Like what was your journey post India? I graduated from the Tilak Ayurved Mahavid Dalai in 1980. And uh, my mother had come to visit Vimalananda in India and she spent five weeks here in India and we went all around, we went hither and thither. And, um, after, after meeting her, Vimalananda said to me, you know, my desire had been for you to stay in India and continue to just, just live a very spiritual life. But after meeting your mother, I can see that your Ranano Bandana, your, your karmic connection with your family is such that it, the, you need to 
find a way to be successful and to make your parents feel like you're well established in life and that you're doing something good for people. And so he said, even though I don't like the idea, you're going to have to go back first to the U.S. and then you'll be going all around the world and 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 trying to assist people to understand a little bit about Ayurveda and Jyotish and and Rasavidya and all these all these vidyas, all these forms of knowledge that we have here in India and introduce to people all of these things that they have no clue about that really we've been studying for the past many thousands of years. So after I graduated and did my internship, then um, I first uh, I, I went for about a year to the U.S. and started talking about Ayurveda. I came back to India um, and Vimalananda and I went on a round the world trip. And um, then he his health was declining. So I stayed here uh, uh, four more years here in Mumbai. And then I started spending much more time in the U.S. and and I started in the U.S., but I gradually went to many different. I think I've, I think I've taught in, I don't know, twenty four different countries or something. And and some countries, like in Italy, I I went there for like a week every year for fifteen years, talking to beauticians, in you know four star conference centers. And I spent uh, went to the U.K. two or three times a year for several years. And I had, you know, a, a group there and in Canada, which is where I met Mr. Mantri, who's my Jyotish mentor. And and slowly I started getting connected even to other unusual places like South America and like not so much. I mean, I've been to Africa. In fact, I went to Africa even before kind of the reason I got to India was because of going to Africa first. Where were you in Africa? Um, I crossed overland from the West Coast to the East Coast. This was back in 1973. I started when I was 19. Which country did you enter? Um, uh, Mauritania. Okay. That's in the southern part of uh, it's in It's in really in the western part. It's north of Senegal. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So landed in Mauritania. Um, and you took back then, in fact, apparently you still do it. You take the iron ore train right. uh, from the coast inland, and then you take uh, uh, trucks or taxis the, the, the in, the down to Senegal. Ore, the iron ore train goes through the Sahara Desert. It goes through part of it's, you know, it's an overnight trip, so it's not that far. But yeah, it's, this is actually part of the Sahara Desert. So I went to Senegal. I went to Mali. I came down to Ivory Coast and I got really sick in Ivory Coast and I didn't know what to do. But thank, fortunately, God has always been uh, kind to me. So I happened to walk into a bookstore where there were um, two young Frenchmen who were running it. And they said, you look terrible. I said, I feel terrible. So they, they took me to their flat with them and they said, we're not going to be here this weekend. We're going to a witch doctor convention, but <laughs> we have a nice young witch doctor. We would like to him to look at your case. So this this very nice young Ivoirian, this uh, Af uh, African man came. He was a bank clerk ordinarily. And he just looked at me for a minute. And he said something into a glass of water. Now, when I got to India, Vimalananda used to use this method all the time, speak some mantras into water and give the water to somebody and they get the result. But I had no clue about this. So I thought, ah, oh, he's talking into the water. He made me drink the water. Within a few minutes, I got very sleepy. I lay down. I slept for I don't know how many hours. And when I woke up, I was 90% better just from doing that. No, it didn't solve the problem, but it really... It, it made me rethink what medicine really was and what other things were. And I continued crossing. I got to Nigeria and I got sick again. And I was in a, a taxi that was I was sharing with a Nigerian kid. And he said, you don't look good. And he said, I don't feel good. So he took me home with him. And uh, his mother was a nurse. And I had spent a week in Ibadan, great city, Ibadan, head of the Yoruba culture. And interestingly enough, back at that time, there was a woman from uh, uh, Austria who had come down and become the high priestess of the, uh, of, the, of the cult of a goddess called Oshun. And without knowing it at the time, this young man, Mr. Olutosin Peters, took me to Oshogbo, which is where the main place of Oshun, and had darshan of Oshun. 
And I, I did not have any clue what was going on, but cut to about um, uh, 10 years ago, and I'm in Sao Paulo, and the, the deities of the Yoruba have come to the Western Hemisphere uh, in, uh, in, in religions like Santeria and uh, Candomblé. And there's a Candomblé house in Sao Paulo, and we happen to go there the day that Oshun is being worshipped. And we have darshan of Oshun right in uh, Sao Paulo. Those deities were brought during the slave trade? They were brought during the slave trade. So the slaves brought their deities with them. And, you know, deities, deities are like, in a way, they're like you and me. They want to travel. So I live in Houston, Texas. And in the southern part of Houston, in a place called Pearland, there is a Minakshi temple. It's the only Minakshi temple that's outside India. And you go to it, it looks like a South Indian temple, even though it's in Pearland, Texas. And the, and, and the people are, the, the, it's, it, everything is really pakka. It's a very well done, it's just like the Minakshi temple, but it's in Texas. I got to bring you back to Africa. Yes. <laughs> so, so I get introduced to Oshun and I don't know that, but I'm introduced to Oshun and then I go through the Congo. And a few years ago, I do 23 and Me, and I find out that, uh, though I had no clue of it, I'm 0.5% Congolese. What is 23 and Me? It's a, you, you uh, test your saliva and find out uh, where your genes have come from. So most of my genes have come from, you know, half of it from my father, definitely from Central Europe, the other half from my mother, some of it, most of it from Northern Europe, but a little bit of Jewish blood and this little bit of Congolese blood. How do you think that got in there? One of my great, great grandfathers owned slaves. And after the Civil War, he, he didn't want to live. Uh, he was living in Texas. He didn't want to continue living there because he wanted to continue owning slaves. So he moved down to Brazil where they continued to allow people to own slaves until 1881. And his daughter, who had been born in Texas, went down there with him and then went back up to uh, Texas with him thereafter. And uh, after he left Brazil, because after the, you know, after the slave trade ended, then it, managing his cacao plantation was not so easy anymore. And unfortunately, he thought that he had a diamond mine and he thought he knew how to trade diamonds, but uh, that's a very specific kind of thing. So he ended up, unfortunately, getting involved in a plot to counterfeit Brazilian currency. And the U.S. had just made it illegal. It was always illegal to counterfeit U.S. currency, but just made it illegal to counterfeit foreign currency. And they wanted a test case. And so they got his brother and they got the brother to rat out on him. There was a big case. It was in the New York Times. He went to jail and now his poor, his poor daughter is there, you know, she's come back from Brazil and her father is in jail. What kind of, what position does she have in society? So she ends up meeting a guy named Lum Atkins. And Mr. Lum Atkins, we don't know where he came from. So he easily could have had some of this Jewish and Congolese blood in him. Wow. That's where I think he came from. How do you trace back that far? Um, one of my cousin's sisters is very interested in tracing genealogy. And nowadays you have all kinds of, you have all kinds of, all kinds of people are trying to fit, find out where, the, especially in the U.S., because lots of people, they've disconnected from where their ancestors came from. Mm. And, and they, don't, they don't have any clue. And they're trying to find out what's going on with their ancestors. Coming back to that Africa phase. Back in Africa. So you now I go through Congo and I don't know anything about this, but I feel right at home in Congo and I'm, and I'm in, I, I'm also welcomed in Congo. So this is nice. I continue going and I get to Kenya. I got to pause you a little yes. bit because we've reached the East Coast now. Yes. What was Africa like in the 70s, I'm assuming? 73. So have you seen this movie called The Last King of Scotland? Yes. That was one of the first movies I saw, which kind of drew out a picture of 70s Africa. And I kind of got scared after seeing that movie. Well, and I did not go to Uganda because of Idi Amin. But otherwise, I had no trouble whatsoever. A couple of times I just slept by the side of the road. I mean, giraffes were walking across the road. There were, there were chimpanzees. There were 
I, I never ran into any big cats except in a, you know, in a, 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 a national park. Um, when I turned 20, I was in Ngorongoro National Park and I was waiting to get into a, a, a hut and two hyenas showed up. Huh? And I really, you know, what, what did I know? I was a white kid from, a, from, you know, the U.S. I didn't know whether hyenas attack people or not. I didn't know whether hyenas could climb trees, but I thought I'm going to climb the tree at, and, you know, at the very least I'll drop down on top of them or something. But the guys with the key showed up and the hyenas left and so on. So I never found out whether they were going to climb the tree or not. I don't think they can. Was was it safe for a white person just... Totally. Utterly. Yeah. Throughout Africa. As long as you were polite to be. Was, and, and the people back then were very... They had... The, these countries had just been, you know, like Kenya became... Uh, liberated from the Brits in 65 or something like that. So they were just getting, you know, it was before before various problems started to kick in. So everybody was feeling like, you know, there, there was a sense of openness and freedom and Africans are very hospitable. So people always took care of me. And uh, it was great to just sort of meet them and find out what they were doing and how they lived their lives and, and, the degree to you know how they uh, how they interacted with their deities, for example. What's the energy of the land like, or can you not generalize? No, you can generalize, and um, and I think the the best way to to say it is in the way that um, one of the first people I met here in Mumbai when I came here was uh, a lady who was married to a Punjabi, but she was a Naidu from South Africa, born in South Africa. And so she knows about, you know, she was a native of Africa. And she said, Africa is all about the earth element. So it's, it, it's you, you, when you go there, you, if, if you're paying attention, you really feel that you are connected to the earth element. And as long as you act from that perspective, and then, then you'll be fine there. But it, it's very much, it's a very, it's it's a very the earth element generally is very stable so it has it 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 back before all of the arabs and the europeans and so on came and started manipulating things it was it, naturally it had problems like every place especially diseases but it's it's a it's a place where there is the potential for great stability and the potential for things to get stuck both so it's a very it's very strongly connected to we would think of as the muladhara the mm. root so if you're if you have a good relationship with your root chakra then that's that's good because you will have an innate stability and if not you will have innate instability did you feel any connection with india while you were in Africa, based on what you learned about India after your Africa journey? I, I wasn't, I didn't have any idea about India. I didn't, I had no, I, I knew I was going to Nepal. I had read a, 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 an old translation of the Bhagavad Gita while I was in high school, but I really didn't have any feel for India one way or another. So I got to Kenya. Yeah. And I had been accepted to participate in a, um, uh, an expedition into the uh, back at that time was in the back of beyond in Kenya to this tribe that had this would have been this was the second time only that they were that that anyone from the outside was coming to meet them nowadays of course everybody has met everybody but back then there were, the the tribe was very much uh, separate the Pokot tribe and. Um, there had just been a total eclipse of the sun a week earlier. And so they wanted someone f from our group to, to join the tribe, kind of like you joined in with this guy in Australia. Um, and so I volunteered. And so there was this whole thing and it involved, um, uh, it involved, there was dancing and uh, originally I would have been expected to go out with a spear and kill a lion. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately for me, things were different. And all I had to do was uh, kill a goat with a spear. Wow. And that was okay. a hard thing to do uh, because I had no, I, I'd never tried to kill a, I, the spears are like six feet long and you had to hold the leg of the goat and stab it. Where? Uh, 
in so you wanted to get into the heart so the thing would not uh, would would not uh, suffer. suffer. And so I couldn't figure out how to do it. Finally, the guy with with me guiding my, you know, guided my spear also. And then we uh, drank some of the blood. And then there was a lecture by the old men. And uh, the uh, it, at least back then, people, uh, you know, what they, you call tardi here, which is fermented um, juice from the top of the coconut, they call palm wine there. So the old man drank a lot of palm wine. They talked about the ancestors and traditions and so on. And um, I have to say that, I, I, you know, when I got back to, eventually I flew to, to the UK, I crossed over land to Nepal, I came down, I got to Bombay. I was actually going to take the boat back to Mombasa and spend time with the tribe, but then I got diverted into India. But after after having this experience of of initiation, I can definitely say that I it opened something for me that that has provided a a, a connection that I can still I can still feel that connection to the land of of Africa thanks to that initiation. Let's talk about this. This sounds a lot like an African version of tantra. Yes. And, you know, if you actually go deep into the Indian forests and you actually meet the tribals, they have their own versions of Tantra. Yeah. Which makes me think that maybe tribes all over the world have followed some version of Tantra or what we refer to as Tantra. Yes, because, you know, what what does Tantra actually mean? What it means that you you want to learn about how things actually work in the world. You know, modern people... They we're relying on all of these things and and we're moving through the world, but we're moving through the world because we have all of these things. Mm. We have food that is delivered to us. We have a place to stay. We have the AC, thank goodness. And um, all of this is very convenient. But suppose, you know, just go back. Uh, I mean, to the aboriginals in Australia, for example, they were doing this even 500 years ago. But just go back to. To when people, let's go back to everybody 20,000 years, 30,000, 50,000 years ago. You were always wondering where the food was going to come from. You were always wondering whether something was going to attack you or not. You were always wondering whether you were going to be safe where you were going to be. You were always wondering whether some disease would come through and what you would do about it. So people had to, they, they simply couldn't behave like we behave nowadays, which is to, Ignore everything and, and assume that all of the plants and animals are, are there for us to enjoy in whatever way we want to enjoy them. People understood back then that animals and plants, they have their own societies. They have their own ways of interacting with one another. They have their own attitudes towards one another. They don't trust humans because humans are not trustworthy. But if you, if you are very patient and you are are very open and you're very respectful, they may let you see a little bit of what they're up to. Plants and animals. Plants and animals, both. Okay. And you're saying this based on what you learned in Africa? or like what Well, you- and then what I've continued to learn in other places also. It's like you, 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 you can, the environment is there for you to interact with. You have to know how to interact with it and you have to, you have you you if you value your life, you have to always remember that it's not human. Uh, whenever I start to think of myself as being, you know, having achieved something, all I have to do is look down here to my arm. Um, and uh, one of the many deities that I'm fond of is the Hawaiian volcano goddess Pele. And I was very fortunate for 12 years to spend like six to eight weeks of the year in Hawaii. And at least a dozen times, I I never counted, I was able to go out onto the lava flow and make offerings into red lava, red flowing lava. So, and those offerings, and of course the lava came and covered them, those offerings are going to remain there for. I don't know, however long the island is there, a million years probably. So my papayas and coconuts are, and so on as an offering. And things would happen in certain ways and I could tell that Pele was appreciating it. But when I started to think that I was something special and I forgot that she was a volcano, one day I was not paying attention and 
uh, fell down and um, lava is, is very, very sharp. Really? Very sharp. This is fresh lava. We're talking about lava that maybe it was only laid down a, a day or two ago. The, you know, if the, you see red lava, it's flowing. That, of course, is that's like 1100 degrees centigrade. That will vaporize your, you stay away from that. You offer something, you do it carefully from over there. You have, if right next to it, you have to be very careful not to stand too long in one place. Uh, or your shoes will start to melt because it's still hot. But after about 24 hours, the top, you know, one foot of it or so has gotten cool enough that you can walk on. This is Hawaiian volcano we're talking about. Very liquid lava, not the explosive volcanoes. Those are very different things. Where are those? Uh, like in um, uh, all along the uh, west coast of the Americas. So like um, Mount St. Helens that blew up. Those are very dangerous volcanoes. This is dangerous. I mean, obviously, I, I ended up with offering quite a bit of blood to the goddess right then. Um, and I eventually had to go to um, the hospital because you don't want to leave the fragments of lava in your skin because they will act as foreign bodies. So, and I... And I tried to take them out myself, but I didn't have the guts without anesthesia to drag, you know, because the skin was all open in several places. But I see that there's a little tiny piece of lava that was missed, and it's come to the surface a couple of years ago. Really? And so I can see it. Yeah, it's the dark spot right there. <gasps> and so I can look at it and I can say, yeah. <laughs> remember, remember to always be respectful, especially when you're dealing with a with a natural force. You've had some life, man. I've, I've had, it's been great in some ways and it's been terrible in other ways. Hold up, we, we, we're gonna talk about this. I wanna know a little bit more about lava. I wanna know a little bit more about this deity, Pele, you said? Pele. Um, first of all, what's the energy of lava like? Other than just hot. I'm asking you a more ethereal question. It's uh, big. It's, it's because, uh, the, this particular volcano, um, uh, it, the the Big Island of Hawaii, there are basically five volcanoes. This is the one, there are two that are still active. This is the most active one. It's one of the most active ones on earth. And so it has been slowly building up its own crater. And it's not that big yet, but, but there is this, and so what there is, is there's a magma hot spot underneath it. So there's a giant, and I don't know how big giant is, but I mean, it's miles and miles and miles across of molten rock that is underneath. And that rock continues coming to the surface. So you can, you, you can kind of, you can kind of, it, it, it's, I mean, there's a lot of rock between you and that and the hot spot, but you can kind of feel the hot spot. And there's a direct connection because that is coming up from the center of the earth. The, you see the lava there and it is not, it is coming up from far, far beneath there. So there's, you, you, you can definitely feel like connection there. But it's also just the fact that you are out in the middle of this place where lava is flowing and it, it's black all around, black lava everywhere. And sometimes there will be uh, methane explosions happening underneath you. So sometimes you'll boom. And, and the, there is, there is the, there's sometimes the, the sound of, of the lava is a particular kind of sound. So it's, it's just, you, it, it's big is the best way I can describe it. It's like you're, it's, 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 it's bigger than you can encapsulate in your way of seeing things. Okay. It definitely has its own consciousness. Yes. And up until recently, um, it was uh, Pele, the goddess Pele, who it is said originally came from um, Tahiti, originally came from Tahiti and, and established herself in this crater, the crater of Hale Ma'u Ma'u. Uh, at the Kilauea volcano. And um, until recently, you could access the crater. Some American guy 150 years ago built a place called Volcano House, and you could sit there. And the, there wasn't always visible lava in the crater, but the crater was always there, and there would always be some steam coming out of it. And then you could go to, you could go around to 
a place where there were, where you could make offerings. And a lot of people would make offerings of gin, but that probably came from some, some, you know, European somewhere or some American. But what she really likes is ohalo berries. And the ohalo plant, ohalo berries are little red berries about this size. The ohalo plant is one of the first plants along with the ohia that start to grow after the lava is laid down. Initially, there no plants are going to be there because the lava is very hot. But then there's a lot of rain. So the rain comes down, the rain gets in there and seeds and land up there. And the ohalo grows. And you can always you could always find ohalo near Halima'u Ma'u. And you would go and find five ohalo berries. You would offer one to her, you would eat one, offer one to her, eat one, offer one to her. And then you know, it's kind of like then you, um, if 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 she was, you would wait to, you know, I, I would do this before I went because I would be saying to her, please let me go out and uh, make off, make some offerings and come back in one piece. And, you know, you would then maybe the geese would fly by at the moment that you're asking or maybe something else would happen. But there, you, you want some kind of response from nature doesn't have to be a big fancy response like the skies open and angels come down. There should just be some response. So the the environment is saying, yes, yes, you 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 have come and you've requested this. Yes, you may do so. And then I would go ahead and do that. So um, I, I, I know that other people relate to Pele in a different way, but that's the way I relate to her. So, you know, it's I I like to. I like to relate to the, to things the way I'm able to relate to them. Um, kind of an Indian question, but are all these a version of Madurga or Kalima or something like that? Like, are they all kind of, do they all originate from the same divine feminine? According to the Durga Saptashati, um, there, uh, every... There, there is only one goddess. Vimalananda liked to call her Adya, the original. Everyone else, no matter where, is a manifestation of that original. And, I mean, while it would be nice to think that, you know, India owns her, nobody owns her. She is, mm. she is com- totally and completely independent. She is Swatantra. And she can do whatever she wants to because people here have paid lots of attention to her and have worshipped her in many different forms in many different ways. She has been gracious enough to manifest repeatedly in different ways, uh, but she manifests everywhere. That that is who she is. I mean, she is in charge of manifestation. She is the 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 she is the mother. So she is naturally everything that is produced on this in this loka in this in Rithu loka it is coming from this original goddess different names different places different guna dharma meaning different attributes but only one goddess what do the hawaiians pray to pele for for is a good question i'm not sure but i mean they they respect her as being you, 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 you know, there would have been a time where kind of like over here, you here, here in India, uh, at least traditionally, you would have an, a Kula Devata. Your family would worship a particular Devata. So in Hawaii also, your family would be associated with a particular Devata. And that might be according to where you lived or what your job was or something. You know, if your job was fishing, then you would certainly want to have a, a, a good uh, relationship with the god of the sea. If, if, you, if you were living near the volcano, you'd want to have a good relationship with the god of the volcano. And of course, for some people, it became more a matter of, you know, a fear-based thing that we must placate. And this, of course, happens in every culture. We must placate the god or goddess so that, that we do, n- do not get smitten and struck down with a thunderbolt or whatever. You know, uh, the first time... A lot of us hear about demigods or these kind of pagan practices while we're growing up, where we read about Poseidon and the Greeks praying to Poseidon, etc. You kind of laugh at it a little bit as a child. Maybe as a child, you're fascinated and then your parents and your relatives and your elders make you laugh at it, saying that, oh, this is so old world. But there's probably some kind of consciousness that the ocean has 
that the Greeks of that time called Poseidon, that the Indians called Varuna. There's some kind of consciousness that the sun also has that we call Surya and other cultures called Ra, etc., etc. What do you think changes when you pray to the gods of these natural things around us? Do you think that if you pray to Surya Dev, your relationship with the sun changes? Or similarly, Poseidon? I, I hope so. I hope I hope that if you pray to Surya Dev, then your relationship to the sun externally and to the sun internally, which of course, on the one hand is your right nostril, that's the Surya Nadi. On the one hand is your heart, that also is the Surya, because it's the if you don't have that, the, the rest of your organism, the rest of the solar system is gone. But but in addition to that, there is the there are the other aspects of Surya. So it's you you if if you're really aligning yourself with Surya. Then, then ideally, what you are doing is you are aligning so yourself with, with all of these aspects. Maybe one aspect more than another. Okay. And I mean, if we, for example, we look back into uh, the um, Ramayana for a moment. Rama was from the solar dynasty. That means theoretically, his uh, one of his forebear, one of his ancestors, was actually the sun. But when it came time that he needed to prepare himself to encounter Ravana, Vasishta introduced to him the Aditya Hridayam, which is a stotra, a, 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 a prayer about, the, about Aditya, about Surya, about the sun. So even, even an avatar like Rama needed to have needed to embody, in order to do what he needed to do, he needed to embody the sun. He could embody the sun because he was in that uh, parampara, in that lineage. So there was the, the potential was already there. It was, uh, the sun was his, ultimately his kula devata, his family deity. But he needed something to activate that in himself so that he could then proceed ahead to do what he needed to do. So, this is be this is happening all around the world in different ways. What's the thing? The difference with India is that people have been doing this for much. There are two two main differences. They've been doing it much longer. They've been doing it in so many different ways. Like in Hawaii, you know, there's there there are a lot of interesting stories about the gods it's, and the goddesses, etc. But but it's one set of gods and goddesses basically. Over here, there's all kinds. There's the Vedic gods, and there's the Puranic gods, and there's local gods. You know, there, there are gods in places that it just for one little area. Because in the past, people were not, people, you would usually worship your grama devata. Every little, every grama, every village or town had a devata connected to it. And that's who you'd worship in addition to your Kula Devata, your family deity, and your Ishta Devata, the deity that you personally had the biggest affinity with. So things are, you know, the difference here in India is things are much more developed. That's one difference. And the second difference is, since the past two or 3,000 years, a lot of the, a lot of the, the Grama Devatas, these are you know, we could we could call them demigods, yakshas and yakshinis and so on. What is a devata after all? Let's say that, you know, Hanu, we talk about Hanuman as the god is the, the the son of the god of wind. So it's the 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 wind has a reality. We acknowledge that it has a reality, like the sea. And if you are like the rishis and the munis, if you sit and meditate long enough, you will start to perceive that the very fact of it having a reality causes it to have some consciousness of its own. Because the entire world is made out of consciousness. This is the, the, the big difference. The Sankhya philosophy and modern physics say the same thing. There was a singularity, it exploded, and now we have the universe, the samsara. The difference is, the modern physics says it was, it was all energy and it was, um, it was, and it turned into matter and consciousness somehow 
came out of that. We don't know how. And the Sankhya philosophy here in India says that's insane to think that way. It was consciousness that started off first with no limitations whatsoever. Neti, neti, iti. It is not this. We can't describe it in any way. It's pure consciousness. But for some reason, it wanted to experience itself. And then as the consciousness became more and more obstructed in the way that the Sankhya explains it, it's become more and more condensed and it's come down to where we are now. <laughs> to our little low level. Our very low level. As it says in the Srimad Bhagavata, this is the lowest, you know, as a, 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 you can't get any more dense than the earth element. It also says that, you know, once you're here, the good news is you only have up to go. You only have up to go. If you were, I mean, you, you, you can certainly, you can certainly make a bigger problem for yourself here in the earth element and get into the kitchard into the mud and <laughs> be there for quite a while. But if you establish yourself health with a healthy relationship to the earth element, automatically you'll start moving in the direction of the sky. Okay. Um, there was one core reason I wanted to have this conversation with you. This is actually uh, the reason I chose to talk about non-India things on today's episode. The reason is my curiosity about Native American culture as well as South American culture. So I think we've covered Africa, Australia, uh, Asia now, uh, and we're moving on to like the deities and rituals of North and South America. Um, I've actually not had too many people on the show who know much about North American culture, especially. Uh, I'd like for you to start this conversation wherever you wish. Uh, possibly... I think it would be helpful if you give some context on Native American culture because even words like Cherokee or places like Oklahoma, I don't think Indian audiences have much context. So you can start off with the 101, sir. Okay. Until, uh, well, aside from the Vikings who came very briefly to Newfoundland, which is the more nor most northeastern part of North America about a thousand years ago, um, the people started transiting from Asia into the Americas maybe 20,000 years ago. So they had plenty of time where they were not being influenced by other people. And they went from all that, that northern area all the way down to the southern part of South America. Columbus shows up 1492. And after that, the, the Europeans start to interfere with things. And so... There, as in Africa, as in Australia, various cultures had developed. Some of them had, had created cities like the Incas in Peru. Uh, like there, there is a, a culture in um, New Mexico, which is a state in the United States that had its own kind of uh, uh, urban sort of situation that nobody knew about that was outside of that area. Even people and even natives in other parts of North America might not have known about it because people didn't move around that much. And then the Europeans came in and then things started to change. The number one reason things started to change is the Europeans brought diseases with them. Diseases that no one in North or South America had been exposed to. So within the first 20 years or 30 years, of any culture coming in contact with Europeans, approximately 90% of the people died from smallpox, from measles, from things that might not have killed people in Europe and Asia, but n the, nobody was, had been exposed to them in the Americas. So right there, a big part of the culture gets totally, just imagine if you know tomorrow, 90% of the people in, in your location suddenly weren't there. How would you keep society together? It'd be almost impossible. So it was very difficult. It's been difficult for the past 500 years, unless you've been totally separated from the rest of the world to keep you, what was going on back then intact. Some people have been able to do it to some degree. Um, so let's take, let's start with North America, uh, where, which is where I come from. There are 50 states in the U.S. Um, 
uh, one of which is Hawaii, which has its own Polynesian culture, and one of which is Alaska, which still has a lot of Native Americans. But the Native Americans in Alaska are very different from the Native Americans in Florida or the Native – because they were they, – they developed their culture in the context of the land they were on. They were – they had a, a, a living relationship with the land. So they were – everybody developed their own different culture. Of course, the Europeans didn't care about that. They just wanted to extract things from the land. So they came in and disturbed all these cultures. Um, and one of the ways they disturbed them is they found out that there were a bunch of people who happened to be on some land that they wanted, and then they either killed them or they drove them away. So, for example, one of the tribes of North American natives that was very prominent in the east part of the country were called the Cherokee. And um, the Cherokee were doing very well where they were. Uh, until the government under Andrew Jackson decided that it wanted their land. And so it forced them to walk several hundred miles to what is now called Oklahoma, which is a state that's north of Texas. And so I went to high school and college in Oklahoma. And that was at that time called the Indian Territory. So all the natives that they didn't want somewhere else because they wanted to have farmland or they wanted to prospect for minerals or whatever, they would send them to Oklahoma. And so you, you ended up with people, uh, another, you know, another large percentage of them died because you're walking in the, in the fall and the winter and it's cold and you don't have enough food and there's disease and so on. Lots of people are dying. So this disturbs your culture also. So they get to Oklahoma, they try to keep their culture intact. It's very difficult because they have all and and the and the and the 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 Europe the Europeans who have now turned into Americans, they are not that they, they don't think that the the natives have any value. They think that the natives should all become nice brown skinned Americans and then everything will be great. But the natives still feel a relationship to the land. They still feel a relationship to the animals and the plants. They still feel that there is something that the Europeans have forgotten. I've heard, I, I don't know this is true, but th that when the aboriginals in Australia saw white people arriving, they thought they were ghosts. And not just because they had white skin, because they looked inside them and they didn't see anything. They saw that there was, there was no... In India, we'd call it dharma. There was no, there was no connection to anything real. There was only hunger. The and and the natives, some of the natives in, um, in 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 North America, uh, there there's a, uh, I forget which tribe, but there's a concept of of what's called a wendigo, and the wendigo is something that just has an appetite. It just continues to eat. Some of the South Americans call the European settlers and their descendants termite people because they don't produce anything. They just eat. So, so there's, there's been, you know, the, the natives could understand, okay, our, maybe this tribe over here, they're our neighbors. We're enemies with them. But we're not going to kill them all off. We're not going to destroy them. We're just going to, we're going to create a boundary and they will have their reality and we'll have their real, uh, our reality. And this is how we're going to live. It was a totally new and different thing for them to have a, a, a group of people who kept coming in, destroying everything, chopping down forests, killing all the animals, and killing everybody who was living or driving away everybody who was in there. So somehow, some of the natives in North America have been able to preserve some of their traditions. And I've been very fortunate to have been become associated with a group of people who is maintaining uh, what what is um, what is called a, a, a sun dance. And this sun dance is where uh, a number of people who uh, who who follow this. It's it's um, this particular group is um, associated with the Lakota, uh, which used to be called the Sioux. Um, and uh, but but uh, that was a French name that was imposed on them. So the Lakota have um, they appreciate the sun. They've lived in a far northern area, and uh, that's an area was very dark in the winter, 
And so you you are really looking for the sun to come back. Here in India, we don't worry about that. You're, there's always the sun. We're not worried about the sun disappearing. But there, you're always the in the winter, maybe you've only got five or six hours of sun. If you're in Alaska, four hours of sun. And then it's dark. And darkness is hard for human beings to deal with. So there, there has always been an appreciation that, that there had to be an alignment with the sun so that even when it was dark, there could be some of that solar energy coming in and maintaining that light on the inside so people would not get dark and constricted and start to, start to become corrupted in some way by that darkness. And so the Sundance is a very, it's, it's a very serious, very serious penance. I mean, if you want to, first you want to really evaluate that you, that you want to do the Sundance and then you, then you, then you have to, you have to pray about it and you might go on a, a vision quest and that would require you to go sit on a, in one place away from everything for four days with no food and no water, waiting for a vision to be delivered to you. And once you get the vision, if if in, everything is in alignment, then you can consider actually doing the dance. And the dance also involves for four days you eating nothing and drinking nothing and being out there and aligning yourself with the sun. So this is very serious penance. And I think what's important to, uh, to emphasize here is that people – the people who do this, they're not doing it for themselves. I mean, we think nowadays, you know, I'm going to do some penance, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get some benefit. They're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it for their people. And that's what the songs say, that I am, uh, I uh, have been per, uh, fortunate to be able to participate um, in this particular Sundance for th on three occasions. And I uh, work with the, the fire because of the sweat lodges and various other things, you, a fire has to be burning all the time. So I like to work with the fire at night because that's, um, the fire has to be kept alive. Who taught you all this? Like who introduced you to Native American culture in this way? Um, well, it started off by, I was introduced to sweat lodges and that was when I probably, I did the first sweat lodge, uh, 30 years ago, maybe longer in New Mexico and New Mexico is a place um, there are a lot of, as its name suggests, a lot of um, uh, Mexican influence and Spanish influence, but there are a number of native uh, tribes there also and have been there for uh, thousands of years. I have to talk a little bit about sweat lodges because I don't think too many people who watch the show know about it. I got introduced to it through a gentleman who owns a resort, like an eco resort in a place called Jibbi in Himachal Pradesh. He made myself and six of my team members do it with him. It's basically a tiny tent that they build. You, you keep like really heated rocks right in the center of the tent. You chant mantras. Uh, you conduct pranayam inside the tent and then you throw water, cold water onto those hot rocks. So it becomes kind of like a micro steam room. Now it sounds simple, but there's some kind of trance that you go into and something extremely primal comes out of you. I remember being through a really low phase of my life when I went through that sweat lodge experience. Uh, right after you get out of the tent, they pour really cold water on you. And this is done in very cold weather. This was done in January in the Himalayas. So I'm assuming it's similar weather uh, in North America as well. Like it's cold outside. You go into like a really hot sweat lodge. You get lots of thoughts. You get to confront your own thoughts. And when you go out, they pour cold, cold water on you. You feel really hungry. And then you eat to end the ritual. At least that's what we did in Himachal Pradesh. But you feel extremely strong after doing that sweat lodge experience. Am I saying anything wrong? Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, except that they're different, different, they're, uh, as with many practices, there are different ways of doing sweat lodges in different places. And in Mexico, they do it slightly different. They call it a temescal down there. So, uh, but, but it's basically the same thing. You're requesting, it's, 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 everyone is together. It should be totally dark. You bring in the rocks, you add the water and you are, you, it's as if you're at the center of the universe mm. and the rocks represent the, the ancestors and you've the grandfathers and the grandmothers and you've requested them to be present and you're asking them for guidance and you're asking 
them to 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 uh, you're asking that they assist you to live in the right way. So this is all about this. This is all very much about aligning yourself with reality. And, you know, this there are different ways to do this. It's, it's like the the thing that is probably the most important thing for anyone in the world is to be aware of what you're thinking. Thinking is a bad habit. It's important to think, but thinking itself as a habit is a really bad habit. So this is one way to address those think uh, that that thought. Another way is um, doing a vipassana retreat, uh, which I've been fortunate to do at, at Igatpuri, which is very near here. Th- uh, and you just have to sit and be with your mind and allow your thoughts to come out and 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 so you become aware of something that is not limited by all these thoughts that are going on in your head all uh, <clears throat> all the time and the as t- as as we go further and further into the modern world and we are being manipulated more and more by the various things that want to manipulate us they will keep trying to make us think in a particular way. Mm-hmm. And we have to be, as far as possible, each one of us, able to think independently. So you can't run away from the world. Maybe you could at one point. You can't do that anymore. There's nowhere to run. So you have to make sure that you are keeping your own awareness focused. And that in the sun dance is one way to do that. So I don't go and try to dance, but I... I and I work with the fire anyway. I, I I worship the fire myself, so I have an opportunity to relate to the fire. And if if you're going to have a sweat lodge, somebody has to be tending the fire, and they are they are encouraging those rocks to assist everybody in the sweat lodge to to purify themselves. And physical purification is one thing, but it's mental and emotional purification. Mm. Let it all be sweated out. Let everything come out, and then you are more open and you're more aware and you're there's the potential then for something good to be to to come down and be present inside you yep. you're making room for prana or life force to enter your body absolutely and you have prana inside you but but what happened is you're corrupting the prana you're 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 holding yourself in particular ways that cause according to the way you're thinking so you're 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 freeing yourself temporarily of a, a large number of those thoughts, and that allows the prana to move into all parts of you, open up dark areas that you may not have looked at before, and bring light into places where light needs to go. And then you can see things differently about yourself and therefore about the rest of the world, and that's a benefit. Fair to say that every experience that we've spoken about on this episode and the last two episodes are somewhat related to opening up the channels of your own body, mind and soul to allow more prana to flow into them. Absolutely. That's what spiritual growth is. I mean, ultimately, prana, we're alive because of prana. Life is all because of prana. So ultimately, really speaking, prana is for living beings like you and me. Prana is God. Okay. Before we move forward with this Native American uh, experience, I want to ask you one, if you could explain the word prana, because it's present in every single ancient culture. Uh, And two, is spiritual growth the same as an increase of prana? So when we talk about Kriya Yoga and autobiography of a yogi, where they say, oh, you grow spiritually, you grow very quickly from from a spiritual perspective. You're basically opening up your body to receive more life force, right? Is that the right kind of thinking? You definitely want to open up your body to receive more of the life force. But just because you receive more of the life force does not necessarily mean you will become more spiritual. Okay, now let's talk about what life force is and then you can expand this. Okay, and of course with words, it's kind of difficult to experience what the life force is. But think about the life force as this. You, we have <clears throat> a sperm and an ovum. They come together. They form one cell called a zygote. From that one cell, you and I are made up of, I don't know, 10 trillion human cells plus another 10 trillion bacteria and, vir- and, and rickettsia and archaea and so on. 
So there, there's trillions and trillions of cells. And then, of course, each one of us is interacting with other human beings and with plants and animals and so on. So a, tr a tremendous complexity is being generated out of this one cell. So prana is what is driving that projection of awareness into this physical world. And so we're alive because there is this prana, there is this life force, the prana that is circulating inside us, keeping the body and the mind and the spirit together. Electricity. Well, electricity is part of it, but it's much more subtle than electricity. Um, I mean, one way to think about it, and, and don't take this analogy too far, is you have a magnet. You have a piece of paper, and you have some iron filings on the top. You move the magnet, the iron filings will move. It's not a physical thing because the paper is in between, but it is a force. So prana is more subtle than physical reality and less subtle than the mind. It's in between the body and the mind, but it's keeping them together because without that, living individuals would not occur. So prana, everything in the world has an agenda. Okay. Is it fair to say that modern society takes you away from allowing the maximum amount of prana to flow through your body, mind, and soul? I think it is very fair to say that because it, you get, you get, it, there's good quality prana and there's not so good quality prana. We're all alive because there's prana. If you do not get enough prana, you will, you will die. We're getting prana basically two ways. We're getting prana by breathing. Immediately we get prana and we get prana by eating. And it's said in Ayurveda that the prana is absorbed from the large intestine and of course, the breath is absorbed through the lungs. So breath, oxygen is sort of like the vehicle for prana. Oxygen and prana are two different. Oxygen is very dense. Prana is less dense, but they're associated together. And the lungs and the large intestine are associated together. And they are in Chinese medicine as well, because they're both involved with taking prana from the environment into the organism. But you take it in, then you have to do something with it. So this is Again, where Ayurveda is, the basic principles of Ayurveda, if only people knew them, this would be a very useful thing. When you take the prana in, it is providing you life force. And that life force will either promote more life force, and that will happen if you are circulating the energy well, or it will turn into what we in Ayurveda call vata. And vata means nervous energy. So you will have energy, but you won't be able to store it. You won't be able, you won't know what to do with it. So you will, you will get jittery and you will talk a lot and you will look at your social media and you will wander around looking for things to involve yourself in because you have all this energy and you feel like you have to do something, but you don't know what you should do. And so the, we're, we're, we're getting energy. We're, we're getting prana all the time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be alive. We're breathing it. But if you're in a big city, um, you're breathing inner, uh, air that has a bunch of pollution in it. But it's not just the physical pollution. You're breathing in the prana of everybody around you. And these are people who are not necessarily spiritual. And what they're thinking about is, how can I make more money? How can I seduce so-and-so -and -so over there? How can I become a big uh, dada? Or how can I become a, you know, a, uh, 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 an important politician? Or how can I become famous? Or people are focusing on that and their thoughts are going out into the environment. So you're breathing in that stuff too. And this is why it is so desirable, if you at all can, get out of the city at least <laughs> occasionally. Go to some place where there is pure air, pure water, and just allow yourself to turn off the phone and just allow yourself to connect to reality. That's the reality. What we're in in the city is not reality. I mean, it is real, but it's not, it's not sustainable reality. Mm. So 
And then we have the question of food. So originally you were getting food directly from the ground and everything was, and there was nice prana and there was no particular pollution. Now the food is polluted, but it's not just the physical pollution. It's the pollution of the people who are growing it, but they're doing it for money and the people who are cooking it, but they're doing it for money. And the people who are are th thinking, whatever it is, uh, Vimalananda in, always preferred to cook his own food. And he was a great cook. And he said, one of the reasons I prefer to cook my own food is because other people, when they cook, their thoughts are going into the food. And unless their thoughts are, are, are uplifting thoughts, it's going to affect my awareness also. So here we are. And you know, you're, you're, you're in a hurry. I, and I understand this. You're in a hurry. You're going to get the water palm from somewhere, you, you know, and you have time just enough to get it some chai. But the person who's cooking the chai, very likely, is doing it for money and not because he or she wants you to, you know, have a, a, a great life and, and have and, and, and be more calm. And, and they just want your, does, you know, 10 or 20 rupees. And the person who is cooking the food, they're probably also, you know, cooking it. For, and they're thinking, you know, the boss is like this and I have these problems and what am I going to do next? And, and all of that is going into the food too. Which is why it's great when your parents cook for you. Yes. That's the underlying logic as well. That is the underlying logic as well. So we definitely want someone who has your interests at heart um, to be cooking for you. And, and uh, I mean, I personally, I don't do a lot of cooking, but I prefer personally just prefer to eat. I eat very simply. I eat uh, some fruit. I eat some vegetables. I have, I have some milk or some curd, uh, yogurt or something. But I like to just do that on my own because I and the food, then there's no complication from outside. I'm a strong believer in the fact that prana can be achieved from the sun as well. If you know how to tap into that kind of energy. I've been reading a lot of work on this. Even with Kriya Yoga, which is spoken about in Autobiography of a Yogi, they say that eventually, slightly controversial statement, they say that your body eventually reaches a point where you can harness the sun for an increased amount of prana through your soul. Absolutely. And I mean, the person that I have known, and I say person advisedly, who, who was able to use this was Jatal Sadhu Rambish Rambardasji, our Guru Maharaj, Vimalananda's, uh, in the book, Junior Guru Maharaj. And, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, he, he did eat tobacco, but uh, he was also getting prana through the sun. And uh, he used to occasionally let me massage his legs. And I was very uh, uh, privileged to do that. And I was very appreciative. And one day, I guess I applied a little too much oil. And he said, stop. And I, th I, I thought, oh, my God, what have I done now? And of course, he was always paying attention to people's thoughts. And he said, no, you didn't do anything wrong. But the thing is, if you apply too much oil, it makes it more difficult for me to get the sunlight down into my bones. And that's where you want your prana. Even the, the Taoists, the Chinese say this, the prana needs to be stored in your bones. So he was, he was an individual and, you know, he was a man who had been in samadhi for hundreds of years, but that's a different thing. He was an individual who knew how to bring the sunlight into his body, store it in his bones, and, and then he didn't need to eat food other than, you know, a, a little bit of tobacco in order to just get some extra juice. Okay. Coming back to the sun dance now, sir. I'll let you continue with that story because the sun seems to be an extremely important spiritual aspect of a lot of cultures all over the world. So let's talk about this one and then we'll break away, talk a little bit more about the sun. Well, and, and you know, the, 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 the reason for the sun dance... Part of it is to be able to experience your own limitations and to be able to go through those limitations. Even if you're not actually out there dancing, if you're there, you're assisting the dancers, you're doing things, you're, you're there with them and you're, maybe you're chanting or maybe you're just, maybe you're just there sitting with them and projecting um, calm and projecting prawn in their direction. And if you're working with the fire, then you're, you're uh, making sure there are plenty of hot coals onto which you put cedar. So there will be purifying smoke 
They use at least this particular uh, uh, dance uses cedar put on hot coals. I mean, it's like a garbati. It's like, you know, any any other kind of fragrance that has, number one, a fragrance, uh, the, the fragrance is related directly to the earth element. So a good fragrance will make you feel more stable, hence the utility of, of using agarbati or whatever. But it should be good quality agarbati and not something made out of petrochemicals because that is going to have a not as stabilizing effect. So this is basically a ritual where you fast, you keep your stomach empty, you allow the prana to go inwards and upwards towards your mind, and you enter a state of meditation while you stare at the sun. Not staring at the sun, but being out in the sun. Okay. So, and and uh, and and the thing is that, of course, you it's you want your mind and after uh, you know the, the not eating and 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 dancing and chanting you're it's going to be much more difficult for you to think so the idea is yes the prana should be you should be purifying on the inside and opening yourself to the reality of the sun and the sun, you know, you know, here in, let's talk about here in India, for example, the sun represents the soul, the Atma. And so th- I, I don't, I don't know that they would describe it in the same way, but it's basically the same thing. It's the sun it gives life, the sun uh, provides heat, which, and the sun provides, um, uh, it, it encourages the production of plants and animals, which we use as food. So without the sun, that would be the end of the whole experience. There would be no life without the sun. So we're appreciating the sun. We're aligning ourselves with the sun. And this is people are sacrificing their food. They're sacrificing their water. They're sacrificing their rest. So they're out there dancing and focusing to 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 send their prayer to the sun Again, not for themselves, but for their entire community. People, people, you know, and this is true of other other traditional groups that I've found. They, I mean, to some degree, you're doing it for yourself. But the main reason is you want your, because you are a limited person. You're going to be here for up to 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, maybe. Then you'll be dead. But where did you come from and who's going to come after you? So what's important is not you so much. I mean, you need to be, you need to take care of yourself, but you're taking care of yourself to provide that continuity from your ancestors into your descendants. So that's what people, they're they're aligning themselves with the sun, partly for their own spiritual development and partly to, to know that they can, to do something difficult and they're doing it, but they're not focusing on that. They're focusing on, having this benefit the entire community that is supporting this this ritual. I think we were talking about this outside when you said that sometimes during this ritual, you'll have a vision or the ritual will allow you to have a vision. What does that mean? Do you actually see something happening? Well, I, you know, I have a very limited uh, connection to this, so I can't, exp- I can't, uh, I can't, uh, speak authoritatively on what kind of visions people have. I've heard about things like that. But the idea is, for, I mean, if you do not eat, do not drink water, and you sit, and I have never done that for four days. I've done that twice for three days. And you become very much clarified because you're, you're, you, now you're not taking things in that of course are being influenced by whatever people have, you know, added to it. And you're sitting and you're meditating and you're proceeding, you're reciting your mantras or whatever it is you're doing. And you can definitely start to feel that you are becoming more subtle. If that's what you're doing. I mean, if you were focused instead on, I'm going to do this to be a big, you know, a, a tough guy, that's what you're going to end up with. But if you're doing it seriously, you're going to find your awareness becoming more subtle. And, you know, the devatas, the gods and the goddesses, they may be able to manifest themselves down here occasionally, but they don't live on this plane. They live in a much more refined and subtle plane. So if we really want to connect with those 
gods and goddesses, we have to be a lot more, our awareness has to be a lot more refined and subtle. So this is, all of this process is for the purpose of making your normal, you know, what is normal awareness for the normal human being? We're, our sense organs are connecting us to the world all the time. We're creating desire. The entire world exists because of desire. So this is what you're saying is for this period of however long it's going to be, I'm going to minimize my desires and I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice. I could be eating. I could be drinking. I could be sleep, uh, you know, comfortable somewhere. I'm going to minimize those things so that I can align myself better temporarily with the subtle realities that are, that we have, that we, meaning our community, whatever that community is. Uh, that have a relationship with. So I want to act as a, you know, some people have said that a human being, the job of a human being is to create a connection between the earth and the sky. All And the sky means maybe, you know, not just the sky here, but the entire universe, you know, the, 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 for the Taoists, it's the set, the Milky Way. I mean, the, uh, uh, the big dipper, the great bear. Uh, other people may have some, but it's out there that is not limited by the earth. So the human being has the ability to, 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 to position awareness in all kinds of different levels of subtlety. Let me have a shot at this. We spoke about how every single spiritual process from any every single culture allows you to increase the amount of pran shakti or life force that flows through your body every time you level up in that life force game it's like as if one of the filters that was originally put on your body and your mind gets removed and you get connected to a higher reality so the more you meditate the more you take part in these rituals the more you fast the more you clean up your body, mind and soul, the more you purify yourself, the closer you are to a higher reality where you don't only have access to the physical reality around you, the mental reality in your mind, but also a spiritual reality that has always been around you, but you've been blocked out from. Yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. Now, the thing is, of course, that as you move in this direction, so you're becoming more subtle, but you've not become totally subtle which means your ego is still mm. present. And there's always that question of the degree to which you are going to identify yourself with that Shakti. And you're going to start thinking that you are something big. You, and so this, this and Vimal Ananda used to say, you know, you make some progress spiritually and you will think, oh, that's great. Now everything is going to be easy for me. No, that's exactly the wrong thing, he would say. The more progress you make, the harder it becomes. The more progress you make, the greater the potential. If you start to identify with something and you start to think things should be a, a certain way, the greater the potential that you're going to take that Shakti and corrupt it yourself in some way. So the, as, <clears throat> as you do more sadhana, yes, you will be, your awareness will become more and more uh, subtle, and it will become more and more connected to the subtler realms of reality. But you have to make sure that you that you continue to to f your your ultimate focus continues to be on whatever it is you're focusing on. Maybe on your guru, maybe on your ishta devata, maybe on the supreme reality, whatever it is. But as soon as you f as as soon as you forget that and you start to think that you are doing it instead of it's it's this process that involves you, but is is much bigger than you are. Then you start to, he would say, dive bomb. You start to move in the direction where now instead of you being moving in the direction of Rama, you're moving you're moving in the direction of Ravana, who has ten heads, the ten sense organs, and who thinks he's the king of Lanka. You're the king of your own re reality. And you're taking Sita, which is your Kundalini Shakti, and you're using her as your ego instead of what she really needs to do, which is connect to Rama, which means the Atma, and 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 you've stolen her. And at some point, Rama is going to come and kill you. But 
and and naturally it will be good if Ram does kill you. But why instead just don't do that and remain as a devotee of Rama or Jesus or Krishna or whoever it is you you want to bow down to? What's the Hanumanji in this anecdote? The prana. The prana. The prana. And that's why um, I don't know who we have to thank. But that's why I suppose Hanumanji himself, who is a Chiranjeev, who is still alive. Hanuman is the son of the god of wind. Hanuman is the 11th Rudra. He is the incarnation of the god of death. He's the god of death because when prana goes out of your body, you're dead. So he's the god of death, but he is, he is the embodiment of that energy that brings life to everybody. The embodiment of prana. The advantage of Hanuman is he is always focused on Rama. He doesn't care. You know, uh, it, it, it's he never gets angry. He may be out there killing things, but he's not angry with them. He's doing it just because he knows that Rama wants him. So, you know, nowadays I see images of Hanuman looking angry. He's not looking. He doesn't bother looking angry. He is not the the thing you know things like he doesn't care about that he cares only about rama rama says go kill that per that individual he goes and kills that individual rama says save that person he saves that person so how fortunate are we that we have access to hanuman and by accessing hanuman we can automatically connect to rama but we're accessing someone who is much more accessible than rama is because Rama lived a long time ago. Don't know how long, but a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Sometimes in the middle of episodes, I just get an intuition to stop. And I've got that intuition right now, right before you began this analogy between Rama and enlightenment. Uh, we were going to talk about South America, but I think we need to leave some stuff for our next conversation as well. Dr. Swoboda, how was this one as compared to the last Two conversations we had. Well, it it was a, a different thing, but it's always it's always nice to to be able to to I I have been very fortunate in so many ways. But one way I've been very fortunate is to have survived this long and to have seen how things are developing over this period of time. And it's very interesting to see that that very internet that can be so challenging in so many ways also has the potential to reach so many people, potentially with things that may be of benefit to them. So this was very totally different from our previous conversation, but um, it, it definitely has the feel that hopefully it will be of benefit to somebody somewhere. The way I look at it, sir, is that the deities haven't just woken up, but they're starting to catch speed in the world again. Feel for the last hundred years, for some reason, deities all over the world had lost some amount of speed. And there were very few Robert Swobodas, but now there's going to be a lot more. Definitely. And the reason that they had lost speed is because people were not paying attention to them. I mean, they might go to the Mandir and, you know, J. Deva, J. Deva or something, but they were not paying attention. They were not actually connecting to those deities. And the deities have to be fed with our prana. That's how they stay. So, you know, Vedic deities, how many Vedic deities do people still worship? Almost nobody. I mean, Vishnu was a, a, a deity. Rudra has turned into Shiva. But otherwise, how many Egyptian deities do people worship? Almost none. You know, the Poseidon, who worships Poseidon nowadays? So those deities can't do anything. They're not being fed with prana. They're not being fed with attention. They, they're, they, they, they are shaktihina. They don't have any shakti anymore. Now that we're, people are actually going and actually genuinely trying to connect with the deities, they're getting some energy and they can do more. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I have nothing to say other than Jai Hanuman, so. So. Jay Hanuman, <laughs> and since it's still the Ganapati Utsav, Ganapati Bappa Moria. Moria. Lovely. Uh, for our American viewers and our international viewers, Google that and say it with us. Dr. Robert Svoboda, thank you. I appreciate thank you. Thank you, I really look forward to speaking to you again and expanding upon your life once again. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you. Thank you. That was the episode for today, ladies and gentlemen. And I've still not covered everything that I'd like to cover with Robert Swoboda. 
please go follow him on his social media handles he's got so much to offer to the world so many experiences so much knowledge the least we can do is show him all our support on social media he's a trs all star if you've not seen his older episodes with us we'll link them down below make sure you go check them out they are most centered around aghori culture and indian tantra but dr soboda is going to be back on the show so tell me what you'd like me to ask him about the next time he's around lots of love to you guys thank you for supporting the ranbir show